before we get started, just to let you know something with the Slido uh, audience participation app, we're getting an awful lot of questions, including from outside, from people viewing this on the live stream. So if you're not seeing your question come up straight away, it's in a queue and we're getting to them as quickly as we can. The aim is to get to more of them, get more of them up in this session than we were able to last time. But again, they won't disappear, they will go into the final report. All right, well look, we're gonna welcome back our facilitator for the morning session, Mary Faden. Mary, all yours. Thanks, Griffin, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ms Jane Martin, who's the Executive Manager of the Obesity Policy Coalition. A career in public health advocacy and policy development has led Jane Martin to her current role as Executive Manager of the Obesity Policy Coalition, advocating for policy and regulatory reform to prevent overweight and obesity. Jane is an active and passionate media spokesperson, advising both state and federal governments on obesity policy. She also has a lengthy background in tobacco control. Jane is a co-chair of the National Alliance for Action on Alcohol and vice president of the Australian and New Zealand Obesity Society. Please welcome Jane Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a real honor to be here today. Um, what you might not know is that I um, wasn't born in Perth, but I grew up here. Today, I saw one of my old school friends <laughs> in the audience, which was really fabulous. Um, and she works in the health department in communications. So that was um, really nice. And uh, so I feel very much at home and, and very, um, very much welcomed. And tomorrow, I'm looking forward to a really great meal of Shark Bay crabs in my sister's garden. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to sing, but I thought Ingrid's singing was so beautiful, especially on such a sad day for her. Um, my mum recently passed away and I haven't been able to sing since. <laughs> so I thought that was a really beautiful um, way to start the day. Uh, it's not all going to be bad news, but it's not all good news. So today I'm going to talk about what should be done, what progress has been made, uh, potential government policy um, areas that they can intervene, current challenges, positive developments, why progress is so slow, and what should we be doing more of. Uh, so I'm going to whip through um, some slides and hopefully you'll be able to um, read them on the screen as well. So there's a number of key policy issues that we are facing and it's fantastic to see WA really shining a light on chronic disease because it's a large problem, as Barry's already talked about, and we need a focus on prevention as well as acute care. I've decided that uh, I should be away for every budget, state and federal. I went to the state health budget briefing in Victoria. There was a lot of talk about ambulances. There was a lot of talk about building bigger emergency services. There was also a lot of talk about building um, more recreation centres and putting money into sport. Um, all building bigger ambulances, more ambulances, more staff. There was nothing about prevention. It was all about putting the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, bigger ambulances, and nothing about putting the fence at the top. And you need to do both. And it was billions of dollars going into this bottomless pit. So very pleased to hear that there is a focus here on prevention. And what I've been doing for the last 12 years is developing and advocating the case for prevention with a few lawyers, in fact, because much of this rests with law and regulation and sits in the um, area of responsibility of our politicians. Um, and we do need a sense of urgency. I think what's happened to us is it's got hotter and hotter in that water uh, and we have, haven't really taken stock when I talk about junk food marketing to children, people kind of glaze over because it's all about gambling advertising now. And I think we're forgetting what these serious problems are and that we need to act and it's still an urgent issue. Uh, and I was very pleased, I hadn't spoken to Barry, but talking about building the evidence base and using the evidence and finding better ways to talk about the evidence, I think is really critical. And they've got some fantastic material there. I really um, urge you to take a look. Two really great reports on obesity. One around um, cohort studies over time, showing that for um, two to five year olds, overweight and obesity has doubled. Showing that the best place to intervene is with adolescents, not children 
a very difficult group to influence, but I'm going to give some ideas about how to do that. And I've been doing a lot of work around building consensus around the policy response because Nicola Roxon said to us, and it was very good advice, in obesity, you are all asking for something different and it's very easy for politicians to do nothing. So try to create a sense, um, shared platforms um, is something that we've been doing a lot of work around. So what should be done? And many of you will be familiar with this, but I know not all of you come from an obesity control background. So I'm just going to give you a little primer. And I think this is a really great um, example. It's quite old, but um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The problem's still there. The gradient, the environmental gradient, is very steep for people. Uh, Nick Cormus, who um, does uh, bariatric surgery, said to me, my patients are on a white knuckle ride to eat healthily. It's very, very difficult. And anyone who's been in Perth Airport knows how hard it is to find even somewhere to fill up a water bottle. And unless we change the environment, we are, not, we are not going to succeed in supporting people to remain a healthy weight and for children not to put on weight over time. So that's really critical to make it easier for people to change their behaviour. Um, this is... Uh, I got a little... I got a... What can I do here? Oh, hang on, what have I done? Gone backwards. Oh, dear. Oh, here we are. Now, how do I go? Oh, there we are. Right. So, oh, I'm going to point. I'm not tall enough. That's not usually an issue. <laughs> uh, where's my, where's my, where are my taller friends? So, up in the top corner, this is from The Lancet. So, they've gone modern. They don't just write great papers. They now do infographics. And I think this is a really good infographic about what is the role of government in all of this. And it's at the top. And they talk about restricting marketing to children, taxing unhealthy foods, legislating for consumer-friendly nutrition labelling, investing in infrastructure to produce healthier foods, subsidise healthy foods to increase availability, affordability, provide healthy eating education, set standards in schools, incentivise healthy food retailers to enter low-income areas, and I, you know, that would apply to um, providing healthy, cheap food in remote communities, provide healthy... Uh, regulate to prevent positioning of unhealthy food outlets where children gather. So there's quite a range of um, areas of intervention for government. And the important thing with this is it's not just sitting in the health portfolio. You can see this sits in agriculture, this sits in transport, um, this sits in a range, of, um, a range of portfolios. So this isn't just an issue for uh, Roger Cook, the health minister, this is an issue for, for probably many of the um, cabinet members of cabinet and others in the ministry. And what's cost effective? Quite a lot. In fact, um, many, many things um, in obesity prevention are cost effective. Reducing exposure of children to unhealthy food marketing is very cost effective. The most cost effective is taxing sugary drinks. Um, replacing trans and saturated fat with unsaturated fat, limiting portion size and packages to reduce energy intake. We know, I was just talking before to Jonathan about this upsizing culture that we have, um, implementing mass media campaigns, and you've got the very effective Live Lighter campaign, I would say gold standard, best in the world. You're very, very lucky to have that. That's really important. And nutrition education counselling, there's plenty of dietitians out there. They want to work harder. There's plenty of people that they can work with. And implementing nutrition labelling to reduce total energy intake and nutrients of concern. So they're the WHO Best Buys released last year. So fresh off the, fresh off the print, printing press um, in order to support countries to meet, meet the sustainable development goals. So what progress is being made? Um, and last year, Deakin University, in fact, looked at benchmarking Australia to the rest of the world as far as best practice in food policy. So this was a, a really fantastic project, and I know many of you in the room participated in that project as informants. Uh, and they looked at the Australian government and all the states and territories. And I'll just start with um, the Australian government. So what they came out with, where um, Australia was doing well, 
was around monitoring. So I'm sorry Barry's gone because there's some good news for him. So we're very good at monitoring body weight at a national level and that's really important so we know where we're going. We don't have a GST on fresh fruit and vegetables. I was a little bit upset when the previous Premier came out, when I was here actually, and said there should be a GST on fresh fruit and vegetables. So I had a pretty busy time getting up at three o'clock in the morning doing media. <laughs> he kept me pretty busy. Um, I was up at 3.30 this morning doing media too about Milo. But anyway, um, I feel sorry for, for Mike Daub, who does a lot of media from Melbourne and Sydney in Perth. Um, the Health Star Rating Scheme, it works very well. Um, Simone's here, who's done a lot of research on comparing that to other um, schemes. It's a very good scheme. There's some problems with it, but overall it works well and it's world's best practice. Food-based dietary guidelines, our guidelines are good. Um, and we have transparency and broad consultation for change, unlike some countries. So that's the good news. But you can see from these orange and red bars that it's not all so good. And there's a lot of other areas where government can make change. And the top seven um, are around having a policy. We have a sports policy. We have a women's strategy from 2020 to 2030. Uh, we, we have many strategies. We're just developing a national alcohol strategy, which will be done soon. We don't have a diet strategy, obesity prevention strategy, and there's no one in Australia in any PHNs who's not above, the majority of people who are not above a healthy weight. So this is a pretty prevalent problem that's not being addressed in a long-term, coherent, sustained way. We don't have a national nutrition policy. Um, we should be considering a health levy on sugary drinks. 36 jurisdictions have either implemented or are implementing. Um, South Africa's just passed their legislation. In April, um, the controls in the UK come in, um, and that's a really important policy. Um, we need restrictions on exposure of children to unhealthy food marketing through TV, but other platforms. Uh, we need to um, change the health star rating system to address anomalies and also to make it mandatory. We're seeing it much more, appearing much more on healthier foods than unhealthy foods, even in the same product range like LCM bars. <clears throat> um, we need to have sustained funding and ongoing support for a nutrition and diet survey. We really need that, that's really important. And I don't think we can rely on um, industry supermarkets to provide that, we've asked them to provide that to evaluate the Health Star rating system. They were part of the group that organised it, helped develop it, and they haven't provided any information. And that's a problem. And we also need to um, um, establish targets for dietary intake around key nutrients of concern because we need a robust system for supporting changes to that and understanding what's happening. We've got the Healthy Food Partnership. It's worked okay for salt. It could work a lot, lot better. Um, and it's been fairly inactive for some time, although it has regrouped. So now to WA. Where is WA up to as far as what is in their remit and what they can do? So Western Australia, you have a top three. Um, you've got Healthway, and we, talked, uh, we heard about some of the work that's being done there from the um, Deputy Premier around um, supporting the uh, encouraging health messaging and discouraging unhealthy food and alcohol uh, sponsorships. And I, I've been involved with some of that work um, as a committee member, and, it's, and I think it is a really, really important, groundbreaking approach and I would really encourage the other, Vic Health in particular, um, to look at how that's been done because I think it's a very good model um, to try and support um, removal of those kinds of products re related back to sport. You have a high quality, very high quality campaign here with Live Lighter. There's very few campaigns that, in, that change not just attitudes but behaviour. And I'm about to go to Europe, the European Congress on Obesity, and talk about it, and I'm expecting to be swamped. I haven't ever seen a mass media evalu campaign evaluation even at those meetings, let alone one that is so successful. So it is absolutely groundbreaking, and I would expect, in the same way that the Every Cigarette's Doing You Damage campaign, it will be providing the blueprint for other countries in years to come. And the nutrition education for educators and inclusion of food and nutrition in the school curricula is good, amongst other things. But there are actions to meet best practice. Monitoring food environments, seeing what's happened, how are children being exposed in particular settings. Um, continuing to invest in these education campaigns, and I believe there is an ongoing commitment, and that's really critical going forward. 
We need leadership across government. As I said, this doesn't just sit in the health portfolio. We need policy coherence. We need a joined up approach. As we've heard already, and I'm going to repeat this, it's everybody's problem. And often governments can undermine each other from one department to another, and we've all seen that happen. It shouldn't happen, but it does, because there's not a joined up approach. Um, need to restrict and protect children, uh, particularly in settings controlled and managed by the Western Australian Government, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And the provision of food to implement healthy food procurement and provision in areas where the government is buying and supplying that food. Um, we need to really um, emulate what we want the population to do, what we're telling them to do through Live Lighter. We should be making that very easy and making that a total priority for ourselves. So the potential government policy responses. So there is a lot of marketing of junk food to children. Children get on the bus, there's an ad for Hungry Jacks, Red Rooster, whatever, on the bus, um, or a Slurpee, they drive to school and they go past these advertisements on the bus or the train or whatever. Um, often the leisure centres are promoting junk food, even just through the branding of the Coke machine and things like that. Cinemas are another place where children see a lot of junk food marketing through children's um, movies. That's something the state government could act on. They could get rid of these junk food ads in kids' films. And often you get out of the film and the ch your child wants to get the toy that is promoted with the film. That's a real issue. Uh, schools um, are another setting that should be free of junk food. And um, ACT have done some work looking at exposure of children in supermarkets and um, places like that, big shopping centres, and there's a lot of junk food marketing in those places, and we've been seeing quite a lot of interactive, these bother boards where children are actually engaging with the product um, on these digital, digital boards. These are the kinds of things that I used to hate as a parent in the holidays when I took my kids to the movies, especially ones that said buy all six or however many there were when you saw the Simpsons movie. And then you'd go there to get whatever they wanted and they didn't have that toy. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And my children in the beginning never even ate the food. It was just about getting the toy. Um, another area which is where um, Western Australia is behind the rest of the country is around killer jewel labelling. Um, we... <laughs> <laughs> Victoria is also running way behind um, and what we found was there were um, outlets that had this and there will be outlets here that have it but it's not put up in a standardised way and also the public don't really understand, it's such big numbers, um, they don't understand what, what it in fact means. So it's very important um, that we have standardised application of this, that it covers all outlets, including places like cinemas, which is probably the epitome of mindless eating and upsizing. Um, and in supermarkets, that it doesn't apply per 100 grams, but a, a price per product like a muffin, and that it does go into places like 7-Elevens, which have Krispy Kremes and things like that. And there are a lot of it, there's a lot of energy in Krispy Kremes. Um, and this is a fantastic campaign that New South Wales did around helping people to understand what 8,700 was. So that's what the average person eats every day, how much energy they eat. It's not exactly what they're ideally meant to eat, but that's what they do eat. So they did a campaign around helping people to interpret those numbers. So when they implemented the policy, they put this campaign together as well. So make the splash with the policy and then support the public to understand how to use it. And planning laws. Um, I've done a lot of work in uh, Victoria around planning um, to try and get health as an objective of the Planning Act. I can see you have exactly the same problem here. And we have a very, we have some very passionate communities. Um, it's all about burger off. You're much more polite in Western Australia. <laughs> They have a whole burger off campaign and in fact you know that McDonald's is feeling it because they, in, in, in um, Victoria they took seven people to court um, as part of that campaign. They dropped the case but they didn't want them to organise on Facebook. So um, you know, social media has really provided a platform for these communities to communicate and advocate and in, in uh, Victoria we have proposals to change the law, it just hasn't changed. But it's a shame when you have communities that do not want these outlets particularly 24-hour outlets, they don't have to prove they're not doing any harm. 
It's up to the community to prove that they are and they don't have the ability to do that. We need to shift the onus of proof and health has to be taken into account. These are the kinds of things that are driving unhealthy diets in our kids, in our adolescents, and what do adolescents eat most of? Burgers, chips and soft drinks. And who's going to dish it out to them in Guildford? The local corner shop will go down the tube and these, these places will survive. Current challenges. I mean, we've gone to a whole new level with junk food marketing of sport. The new AFL X campaign. People were talking about the advertising because there were the goals, um, you know, so we've gone from the Zupa Dupa KFC cricket to the AFL X. And now we're going to go into the AFL and there, I mean, Faye has done some fantastic work about the amount of junk food sponsorship. It's wallpaper. It's just, we don't even notice it. We kind of notice that because it's blue and it looks a bit different. It's not red and yellow like the Macca stuff. But this is just, and we kind of get used to it, but our kids pick it up and they just, it's just, it creates demand. I saw a little girl in the supermarket saying to her dad, giant super duper stand, I want one of those. It's just water and sugar. That's all it is. So this kind of stuff is, and the highest rating kids programs are sport. So this is what our kids are seeing all the time. Um, and then they're getting it through, through TV as well. So I'm just going to play this little vignette. Yep, Scott is going to help me. Wednesday, book report two. Win a movie ticket? Cool! Oh no, bus is late again. Slurp is for only one dollar. I could get ten. Yes, best player. Wait till I show Jake my Macca's voucher. I wish I had a phone. I could get that Hungry Jacks up too. Jake won a thick Jake. Milo sponsors my cricket team, so I think it's pretty good to buy their stuff. Half price. Come on, the half price. I wish I could be a ninja warrior. I love KFC. Millions! Can't wait to go to Macca's again. But, and a lot of this marketing isn't directed to us. We don't, we don't see this. I just learned, of it, learned about it through my children. And um, it really tipped me into obesity prevention because I could see that they were being marketed to as kids as the tobacco industry marketed to adolescents. And it's pretty unfair. So what's the problem with, um, with advertising and marketing and self-regulation? Well, if you're setting your own rules and marking your own homework, you're going to get 10 out of 10. And that's what the um, Food and Grocery Council says their scheme does. They're doing very, very well, but it doesn't reduce exposure. There's no evidence anywhere in the world that self-regulation works and it, it should be reducing exposure. The highest rating children's programs aren't covered. Coca-Cola are launching their Raspberry Coke in the highest rating children's programs to target teens. So our young kids are just collateral damage with that and they're not being held accountable. It doesn't address new marketing platforms, particularly um, Facebook, um, and uh, Snapchat, uh, those platforms, no sanctions of breaches because you don't, you know, you don't smack yourself. Um, and they determine their own nutrition criteria. So I showed a box of Cocoa Pops before, 33% sugar, they meet the criteria to be marketed to children. And yet the industry say they meet government guidelines and nutrition standards. Well, that is not true. Um, and there's a very narrow interpretation. So if there's an advertisement um, that is very childlike, and some of these ads are very childlike with animations, if they say um, it's to create nostalgia in adults for their childhood, like they did about one ad set in a school, then it's said not to be primarily directed to children. So the bar is very, very low. Um, some other um, good things that are being done are the Health Star rating system. We did quite a lot of advocacy to get Kellogg's to adopt it. Um, it's the only voluntary scheme where they have taken on the front of pack labelling, but as I said, it's appearing on healthier foods and not the less healthy foods. And there's a number of problems, although number three, uh, my, uh, Nestle have just taken the Health Star rating off Milo altogether. It should get 1.5 stars. 
you buy it in that tin, uh, but they've taken the, a, cup, uh, a cup of skim milk um, and added that into the, into the system to get four and a half stars. And that's problematic. And some products which are high in salt or fat or sugar can get a high star rating. We don't think that should happen. Stars should be on all products, particularly those marketed to children. Added sugar is not ad adequately dealt with in the calculation. And having five health stars on, um, on fruit juice um, is not appropriate either. All right, let's, let's be happy now. <laughs> Doom and gloom. Um, but we have seen some really um, good moves uh, around whole of government approaches. And these have been done in the ACT and New South Wales. New South Wales has a 25 year strategy, clearly bipartisan, working towards um, change over, over time. And their, and their aim is to see um, slow and reduce childhood obesity. ACT are the same, both led by the Chief Minister and the Premier. Um, I went to a meeting the other day in New South Wales and there was some from the Department of Premier and Cabinet. So this engagement and involvement from senior levels of government and across Cabinet um, is, is good and there's a lot of very good things happening um, as a result of these long-term commitments. Um, changing the food supply, there's a lot of activity. The community is really behind this. So even when we're not seeing um, broad-based statewide approaches, we're seeing places like the YMCA get rid of sugary drinks in all outlets that they control. Fantastic move. We're seeing um, the Western District Health Service saying we're getting rid of sugary drinks. We're seeing Geelong City Council have a fo whole focus on reducing availability of sugary drinks. The pool um, in Geelong, the Lara Pool, took, got rid of all their red foods and they're mostly green foods. Okay, they lost their coke awning. Now they've got something else there. Um, no decline in spend per person. With the YMCA, again, no decline in spend per person. Um, so there's a lot of activity happening at the community level, getting rid of the snakes, bringing back the oranges, Melbourne Sports and Aquatic Centre, don't have any red foods anymore. Um, they broke their contracts with the um, suppliers of their vending machines. <laughs> um, the head of the uh, organisation just said, rang them up and said, I want to break them. And they said, you can't. So he said, I've put them all in the loading dock uh, and you can come get them in a couple of years, but you can get them tomorrow if you want. And they came and picked them up. But this kind of leadership is really important. He got rid of all the Fredo Frog branding around the kiddies' swimming pool. It was awesome. It was really good. And um, New South Wales, at the end of last year, no sugary drinks in New South Wales health services. Gone. The announcement was made in July. They were gone by December and the food supply in health services has to improve. This, hospitals should be promoting only the healthy choice. If you want a Coca-Cola, get it brought in. If you want a good coffee, you have to get that brought in, for goodness sake. <laughs> so let's be real here. Um, hospitals should be mirroring and promoting healthy food choices, not Oh, I went to Liverpool Hospital, I don't want to talk about it, Western Sydney, the highest rate of overweight and obesity in Australia. Terrible. So why is progress so slow? Um, I'm not going to put all the blame on me, <laughs> but sometimes I think, oh, why is it so slow? What do I, can I do better? But I think uh, we've seen this week that the food industry is loud and proud and very influential with economic power comes political power. And somehow they've got a seat at the table. And I think that started with the Preventative Health Task Force. Um, um, and when, oh God, I can't remember her name now. But anyway, the woman who then headed up the Food and Grocery Council stayed on that preventative health task, Kate Carnell. And we shouldn't have industry in the room making policy. We should have them in the room when we're talking about implementation. We don't have enough pressure from civil society, but I think that's changing. And I think in Western Australia, you have a very motivated um, community because you've had a campaign telling them how to change. And I think they'd be supportive of government making changes that would help them and their families and create a consistent environment. Um, sometimes parts of government can't implement policies. There's no point in me talking to the minister about implementing a tax on sugary drinks in Western Australia because they don't have the constitutional ability to do it. So you kind of need to know who can do what. And I mean, I wish Barry hadn't gone because I'm playing into his songbook, too little empirical assessments of programs and policies. The evaluation often comes too late or it's not done at all. We need a dietary survey, that is really important. 
Um, oh, and these aren't my views, these are from The Lancet again. <laughs> um, and Margaret Chan um, put it very well when she said, it's not just big tobacco anymore, public health con must contend with big food, big soda and big alcohol. All of these industries fear regulation and protect themselves by using the same tactics. That's why we're seeing all this self-regulation. It's a problem for everybody. As Barry said, it's not a failure of willpower. We've got more than a million people in this category. There is something seriously wrong with our society. This isn't everybody lying on the couch and throwing up their hands and saying, forget it. This is a deep endemic societal problem that we all need to grab and see what needs to be done in, in the areas that we can influence. And, oh, sorry. Sorry, Beverages Council. You didn't come. Anyway, uh, hi, you're probably watching online. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> but, you know what, I don't think the head of the Beverages Council is an expert in public health. We don't go to their marketing <laughs> seminars. We don't, we don't rock into their strategy workshops. Why should they be coming and sitting at the table with what we're doing? I've read their annual report. What are they doing? Working against a tax on sugary drinks being adopted as a policy at a federal level, undermining school canteen guidelines and undermining hospital guidelines. So where do you think they're going to go with this one? Do you think they're going to say that's a good idea, changing the food supply? I don't think so. <laughs> and what they are doing is what the tobacco industry did. They are forming the same groups with the same people and I know a lot of you are involved in tobacco, the Australian Association of Convenience Stores, Australian Association of National Advertisers, same gang, same people, same stuff. Individual problem, we want to work with you to support individuals to make healthier choices. They'll just sit back and create the problem and then individuals and government will mop it up. Not good enough. And they frame it as a problem for the individual and the parent and then the government is heavy handed and it's a nanny state. Well you know what, we're all going to be paying for those hospital beds, the bigger ambulances, that kind of thing. And I know I had to put up the beetroot. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Barnaby. But, you know, there was Barnaby saying, you've got to do the elf diet, eat less food. It's too late for that. That horse has bolted, eating less food. We've got to do the tobacco control elements, change price availability and promotion. So what do we need to do more of? Building consensus. This is our tipping the scales report for the federal government. Eight urgent actions that have been agreed by 36 public health groups. Public education and mass media are really important. As I said, Live Light is brilliant. And people want a fact tax. Wow, I know. People support a junk food crackdown. The public support this. Don't be misinformed. People want this kind of stuff. They get it. I think they get it because we've been so successful in tobacco control. So finally, I want to say we all have spheres of influence. We all need to build and amplify on what has already been done. There's some very, very good stuff happening here. We want the bottom up. That's really important, but we need the top down. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You got us all really charged up, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, there are so many questions that I'm actually going to go directly to the questions that have come from the audience. Yep. Um, and although you have answered this question, I feel like there's such strong supports for it that uh, I'm going to say it anyway. Would the banning of vending machines that sell unhealthy food and drink in WA hospitals be one low-cost opportunity for WA Health to lead by example? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so why is it, why hasn't it happened, I guess? Well, and, and uh, uh, just the experience from uh, Victoria, some of the work that they're doing um, is about trying to support the people that make the products for these vending machines to make healthier products. So school canteen food has changed mm. because there are guidelines. So the industry, if there's demand, the industry responds. So it creates an opportunity for innovation 
And I'm sure there are parts of government which support that kind of thing. So if you create the demand, the business will come. And if that's a concern, it's starting to change in, in places where that demand has been created. So in other words, the hospitals need to be asking for it or the hospitals can make that decision on their own? The hospitals can make that decision, but don't worry, there will be businesses that can deliver mm. a healthier product. Okay. Um, the, uh, these are in no particular order because they keep reordering themselves. Um, what skills are missing in the current public health workforce to achieve the policy changes required, such as removing food marketing to kids? Um, I don't think we're putting enough... Um, well, I mean, this is kind of a sad story. My group is 1.3 EFT for probably the biggest public health issue in Australia to do advocacy on behalf of public health groups. That's pretty bad. I don't know there's anyone in this room working full-time in obesity prevention. I mean, great, good, three people. You know, that is a tragedy. That is a real tragedy. We need to put more resources into the advocacy. Look at what we're up against. How many people does Jeff Parker have in his team? A lot, and the AFGC. So we're up against not just the lobby groups, but these big businesses. We need to be talking to um, politicians. We need to be building the evidence base. We need to be investing in this, uh, and we need to, be talking to people all the time, but we don't have the resources that we need to do that. How do we target and address excess body weight in disadvantaged populations? And I know we'll be hearing from Wendy Casey on this in the next session, um, but including welfare dependent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and people with a disability. That is a really uh, difficult question because I think we need to do these broad based environmental press the broad-based environmental levers that I was talking about, but in sp some communities we need to bring in particular programs. So there's programs like Food Sense, which helps support people to shop, prepare, uh, health, shop and prepare, shop for and prepare healthy food, for example. But there are right, wider social determinants that underpin this that are not going to be addressed by programs. They need, um, you know, education, um, a lot of those social determinants of health sit, sit behind that and there would be improvements not just in health but in, in other areas. Mm. Uh, but there are a lot of things and I think Wendy's going to talk about some of them for Aboriginal communities in particular that are likely to be more successful than others. Um, you talked about how urgent it is that we have this national nutrition policy um, and that, that's the question here is what would it take for us to get, get that started? Well, I think um, a lot of work has already been done. Um, it, uh, a policy has been developed, uh, the background for that policy. It has been um, made public through FOI. So a lot of that work's been done. I know there was a meeting with um, uh, Fiona Nash, but I think uh, out of that meeting she decided we didn't need a policy. But I think we all need to talk about it. I think we all need to put pressure on our politicians to do more. This is the system can't cope. And it's what happened in tobacco control. The system couldn't cope. And in the end, the, that reverberated through society and the same thing is happening. So what would you want to see in a nutrition policy? Well, I think we'd want to see the evidence-based recommendations from the World Health Organization, for example, around ending childhood obesity. And they go to protecting children from unhealthy food marketing, but they also go to the broader areas of healthy food supply, putting a health levy on sugary drinks, um, a range, better labelling, a, a range of things. It's, it's, I know it's complex, but it's kind of simple. Yeah, so it's the same stuff that keeps... You know what to do, again. it's the implementation mm. that's the problem. But it's interesting, because I was reflecting as you were talking about how, you know, where you're setting goals for, for making progress in this area, and about how the narrative around the goal is often kind of negative, but to turn it into a positive... So, so it's a deprivation of all the things we like to eat and drink. Um, but how do you change that narrative into something that's really positive so that it's, it's not about fat shaming as it, as it is about celebrating, you know, people being in their right size, healthy bodies, active and well? Yeah, and it's about understanding food as culture as well, I think. But I think it's also how you talk about it. And um, I was talking to an endocrinologist who treats women um, with... Uh, who developed type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes. And she was saying we should talk about being an unhealthy weight because it's the new normal, particularly in some communities, people are mostly obese. Mm. So people can't really judge where they sit. They think they're an okay weight. So she tells them they're an unhealthy weight. And then she, she tries to make it real for them and says things like, if you drink 
um, a cup of you know a cup of coffee a day, just cut out one cup of coffee. So trying to give them, you know, if you have a biscuit at morning tea or two biscuits, make it one biscuit. So her aim is just to, because that's where the weight gain's coming from, not very much every day. So she's trying to make it real for them, achievable. Even if you don't put on any more weight, that is quite appropriate because Barry didn't say this, but we're all ageing over time and we're getting he heavier at younger ages. And the where, where the growth is, is in obesity. So the more we can keep people from moving into these unhealthy weight categories, the better. And I think making it achievable and being respectful and supporting people in that is really important. So what was your attitude to his suggestion that a three kilo uh, loss would, would be great? Good um, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know if Liv Light has got any data about how do people lose weight, but it's pretty difficult for people to lose weight and even losing 50%, 15% of your body weight is a good thing. So I think we should start by supporting people not to put on weight over time and, you know, tips for not putting on weight over Christmas and Easter. I mean, Easter's already started. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, people, a treat isn't just on one day, treats are all the time. Mm. So I think we need to, and people put on weight during those holidays. So it's about supporting them to just, be a little bit more mindful, but not in a, you have to lose three kilos. It's, it's too much for people. Mm. I don't know if this answered your question, Pip, but Pip's put up a question that says, how, how can we ensure our obesity programs do not veer into the shame and blame territory when people don't succeed? Yeah, and I think that's why um, having a number of different messages, depending how motivated and able people are to make change, is important. So whether it's weight maintenance, whether it's weight loss, um, I think there's different ages and stages. Um, so I think we need to be aware of that and it's not appropriate for a 70 year old person potentially to be losing weight, mm. for example. Um, so people understanding what is a healthy weight, but understanding before they get into these unhealthy weight categories, because it is hard to lose weight. Yeah. How much do you think the, the community around you, as in everyone working towards a, a similar kind of goal, it makes a difference to achieving the goal? I think it makes a really big difference because it keeps things simple. If government wants to act, they need to know that they'll get a lot of support, particularly if political capital is involved and some of this stuff, there's political capital. So I think they need to know that there is a supportive uh, public health community and, and others. ACOS have come out supporting a 20% health levy on sugary drinks. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, important to know who's behind it, where the support will come from, and also that it's acceptable to the public. And for those groups that do need extra support, if it's a, a, if it's a health levy, for example, then you need to do something in um, disadvantaged communities, so potentially add more subsidies to healthy foods, yeah. put in more programs. So a little bit like when the, um, you put health warnings on cigarettes um, or tax cigarettes, I think there was a subsidy put on um, nicotine replacement therapy. So thinking about how, you know, a uh, uh, carrot and stick kind of approach, um, I think is helpful. Mm. Uh, because it crossed my mind that where you're saying that there is community support for, you know, healthier eating and for getting rid of junk food marketing and all that kind of thing, it's actually a cry for help. You know, please help us find a solution to this battle that we're having in our daily lives. Absolutely. I mean, everybody, everybody faces it. And, and I don't know, if you're in the supermarket and you just see parents fending their children off, you know, and there's Geoffrey Parker saying, just say no. Well, that's fine. But low-income families do want to treat their children. They can't buy them, a, uh, you know, a bike or take them on a holiday. So this is how they treat their kids with these kinds of things. And that's understandable because there's not a lot of other things that, you know, they're quite disempowered. So I think we need to think about, it, as a parent, it just drove me cr in, I mean, I couldn't stop it. My daughter at two said, oh, she saw something purple. She said, purple is chocolate. It was two. <laughs> And she knew about McDonald's and it was just, you know, her, she won her basketball and they went to McDonald's to celebrate because they got these vouchers. She'd come home with that chocolate fundraiser. It was just, yep. the sport was full of bring the snakes. It's like, I'm not bringing snakes to the sport. But I was that mother. Mm. And she was like, well, don't go into the school. <laughs> don't you dare go to my school. <laughs> oh God, it was terrible. But I didn't want to be that person. But that I was forced into a corner by the industry and I was forced and I couldn't protect my kids and I had a lot of resources at my disposal <laughs> so I think a lot of parents face that it's it's difficult mm. another question from the audience is how do we make these policy changes uh, particularly I guess in the, that urgent list that you came up with um, without uh, with avoiding the accusation of nanny state 
Well, I mean, you're going to get nanny state. But I think the thing is, do we think it's good not to have seatbelts in cars? Do we think it's good to allow people to smoke in offices? Uh, do you think we should have campaigns to stop people from swimming outside the flags? I mean, all these things are designed to um, support people to be healthier. And nannies look after children. That's what I would say. You've been asked that question before. No, I just think, why is nanny such a pejorative term? You know? <laughs> but it's, that's what government does. That is their role. Mm. They do that, and it helps to iron out inequality because it applies to everybody, mm. and that's really important. I'm sure you know, low-income families spend more time watching TV than high-income families, and they're seeing more of this marketing. Yeah. Uh, well, along those lines then, the, the question is, how does government persuade food industry to stop marketing, promoting and discounting junk food and sugary drinks? Well, they don't persuade because we've been trying to persuade, and how's it going? Not very well, I don't think. What do you, anyone think it's going well? <laughs> Unmitigated disaster. So I don't think you negotiate. I've, I mean, I've done it. I've tried to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that because I haven't got experience in it. I have, I know, I've, I've done it. It didn't work. I've done it a few times and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you need to regulate. You need to have a stick. Now, we're, I think we're probably gonna see industry come out with more self-regulation around marketing because it's going to become a hot, hotter topic in the lead up to the federal election. Mm. We don't need more self-regulation. We need, we need regulation. We need to create a level playing field. There are some businesses out there that don't market to children. You know, there are businesses that are doing a good job. So we should, and we should support the promotion of healthy food. There are plenty of companies out there making healthy food that could be marketed mm. to kids. But bring it on. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction that you've got a, a lengthy background in tobacco control as well, and I, I know that you, you're obviously a great admirer of the Live Lighter campaign, which has some parallels to, to anti-smoking campaigns. How many parallels do you think there are in terms of the way we can approach dealing with obesity and the way we approach dealing with tobacco? I think there are a lot of parallels. It's about pricing, promotion and availability. It's about demand and supply, and we need to look at both sides of that. Um, some of these industries are the same industries. They've just hived off their tobacco bits because of the um, because of concerns around litigation. You know, Coca-Cola, Amatil, <laughs> that was a tobacco company. Mm. Um, Rothmans and, and Kraft, Jacob Souchard, Philip Morris. I mean, they were all the same people. So I think we need to take the same approach. We need to do education. We need to regulate around supply and price. Um, and we will get change, but unless we do that, we're going to get millions more people in an unhealthy weight category. And what will happen is we will not have a healthy, productive workforce. And I think speaking to that economic cost is really critical. And COAG did that, and that's why they put the funds into the Preventative Health Agreement, mm -hmm. which has been now pulled, which the Food and Grocery Council are very supportive of. Surprise, surprise. But that was really important. That was funding some important preventive action in, in the states. And that it's just the foot is off the pedal. And I think it is hard to argue for prevention. It's because, as Simon Chapman says, no one's gonna knock on my door and say, thank you for not stopping me from starting to smoke. And you're not gonna get the benefit in your political term. So you have to really commit to something which, you know, in the typical kind of political world is gonna be difficult and a relative hard sell with the commercial interests mm. that are involved. But unless these vested commercial interests are taken on, we will continue not to get progress. We are not meeting our benchmarks. Mm. No one's shining a light on that. So uh, I think we need to work harder to show the problems. So what was the, the clincher then in terms of the tobacco campaign that I guess galvanised that political will to the point where something actually got done. And have we got there with the, with the evidence that we have with obesity, or are we still looking for the, you know, the, the golden ticket? We don't need any more evidence. And as more evidence comes out, it's sort of like, yeah, we know that. Yeah. You know, I think there's this sort of complacency that, yeah, everyone's, you know, huge obesity problem. Uh, so I think that's a problem. There's not a sense of urgency, as I said. I think about this quite a lot. I'm not sure what happened in tobacco. I think we were very coalesced, the public health groups, around what we wanted. Um, and so we were all pushing in the same direction for quite a long time. 
And there wasn't any one thing. It did happen slowly. I mean, Mark Daub said overnight success doesn't happen overnight. But um, it was, in the end, I think it was the economic cost to government that really helped. When, once Treasury understood what this was doing uh, to the system, the health system, but I think we're starting to see that. We've just started to get um, the colleges advocating around this issue, but up until now, they've just been replacing people's knees and trying to get more lap banding. But now they're on board, and Nick Talley said to all the presidents of the colleges, you should make the health services healthier. Get rid of these junk foods and drinks. So um, we're starting to, I think it's really important we have the medical profession on board talking about having eight nurses to move a patient every few hours. Um, the lifting machines they have to have, the, you know, in, this is terrible and the, um, the political correspondent of the Herald Sun always wants me to talk about this, but we have people going to the zoo to be scanned mm. because they can't fit into the... Yeah. health system but this is you know and I know the new uh, Fiona Stanley hospital was the corridors are wide the toilets have all been built the chairs or the beds everything's been built to carry these very heavy patients because that's the new reality so we put it into infrastructure but we also need to make a, a change to try and stop more and more of these people um, you know entering our health system. So then to does there need to be a political champion in this? Somebody or a group of people who are currently, I don't know, maybe they are in existence, maybe you know their names, or maybe there isn't anybody who is currently in power who has that will and is prepared to galvanise the right people to drive that th the thing, to, the, to really seismic decisions that actually make a difference. Yeah, and I think Baird, to some extent, and now Berejiklian coming in in New South Wales, I think, I think they are, I think the Chief Minister of the ACT, I think they are um, champions. I think they are the people we should be looking to, to see how did they do it, what did they do, what, what's the model. But that leadership is really important. And you're right, we need a champion like Nicola Roxon around plain packaging. You do need a champion because you're going to be harassed and your office is going to be wrung and the same as the alcohol industry, we'll hear about that this afternoon, you will be put under pressure not to take these effective actions and so far the industry has won in stopping that but we need someone to stand up and say, I'm doing this for kids, I'm doing this for families. You know, I always think of Western Australia as such a healthy place, you've just got such a fantastic physical environment, wouldn't it be greater if... Uh, wouldn't it be good if it, we had a, a, a healthier environment? Mm. Um, you know, you could really make a stand out and um, you don't have a food industry based here, so you have a big advantage um, in that respect. Just need a champion. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Anyone? Um, going back to the questions from the audience, uh, should the amount of sugar uh, be mandatory, rep uh, mandatory reported on alcoholic drinks? Um, well, I've just discovered this. I met Robert Lustig, who's um, a sugar campaigner. I also met Sarah Wilson with him at the same time, and they were going off to have a glass of wine. And I was like, oh, but what about the sugar? And they said there's no sugar in wine. So if you put a nutrition... I know! Awesome! So if you put a nutrition information panel on a wine bottle, it would just have energy. So I think we should have energy on alcohol containers, mm -hmm. but not a nutrition information panel because then it wouldn't have any sugar in it and it would probably look good and people would think that was a good thing but there's a lot of energy in alcohol. Um, going back to regional and remote communities, this question says Aboriginal people and people living in remote areas don't have sufficient access to nutritious foods. I think this stat was that it cost them 30% extra for the same uh, kinds of foods. Um, should this be included in policy actions against obesity? Oh, definitely, absolutely. And I think that needs to be an absolute priority. That it's a human right, food and water, and you cannot get healthy foods. And I think um, Wendy's gonna talk about some things that can be done, but, and having gone into some of those communities, I was, I was really shocked. You can always get white bread and Coca-Cola. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be happening. And I know Mandy Lee talking about the APY lands and trying to get a fridge put in and she didn't get a fridge, they put in a deep fryer in the store and then they had to build a, you know, 10 years later they're building a dialysis unit, oh. you know, for the sake of a fridge. This is, these choices are being made all the time but they have really deep, long-lasting repercussions and for Aboriginal communities, people being taken away from their homelands to have dialysis is, it's really tragic. It's, but I think a really strong focus needs to be put on those communities. What are the pros and cons of having supermarkets at the government obesity policy development table? Um, 
I don't think supermarkets should be at the policy development table um, unless they show commitment. So um, Gary Sachs, who did the Food Policy Index, has done um, looked at um, the policies of supermarkets and they don't even get to 50%. They hit 46% as far as um, best practice. And that's just on policies, not what they actually do. So I think um, if you look at what supermarkets biggest sellers are, it's Coca-Cola, white bread, PAL and cigarettes. So that's their business. So I think we need to be cognizant of they get people into the store with their fresh food. But I think there's a lot more work that can be done and I know they've explored it, but I don't think they've done it. Um, I want to go back to the, the data question, which is kind of still on my mind, about how, what evidence do we have that change in food policy actually helps people at a grassroots level to lose weight? Uh, well, that's a, uh, that's a good question. It's just the time frame is so long for, that, for those um, proximal changes to then play out. So it's, it does take decades to see. It's not like someone just quits smoking and then well, they I quit. saw that picture of visceral fat in the Live Lighter campaign. It changed my life. Yeah, and my, one of my team saw that sugar film and said, oh, I didn't realise there was so much added sugar, and, and she lost quite a lot of weight because she and her family were eating a lot of added sugar that she wasn't aware of. I mean, educated woman, and, and she didn't know. And I think telling people that information is, is interesting because people think that it doesn't make a difference, but that's why the Live Lighter campaigns succeeded, because it's made people think, stop and think. And that's really important, and across all socioeconomic levels as well. So that's really critical too. You're not just talking to the worried well. Um, and now I've forgotten your question. <laughs> uh, it was about whether changes in food policy actually oh, yes. gets people to lose weight. Um, well, that's another funny thing. I, should you look at whether they don't put on weight at the same rate? Mm -hmm. Because we're all putting on weight, basically. So um, what, what are you measuring? You just want to know, is the trend changing at all? Is it slowing down? Um, that's really what you want to know. The impact is, yeah, if, if it slows. But maybe you want to look at diet first. That's why I think we need a dietary survey. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, the diet will change and then it will have an impact on weight. Yeah, and then over longer time, people won't ever become as fat as they were becoming. Yeah, yeah. that's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hope dream. I'm still alive. <laughs> um, how can we make a whole of government approach to action on obesity and necessity at the ballot box? Is social media the answer? Yeah, and this is, um, you know, I think people like Jamie Oliver, uh, people like Sarah Wilson, whether you like her or not, people like that have a huge social media following. Jamie Oliver got the levy on sugary drinks in, in the UK. The politics was right, so that environment was right, but he got that over the line and he spoke to the public. And, and we need those same champions, um, community champions, as well as political champions. But that tipped it. So people like that and creating a community for change is really important. And you don't have to get government policy. You can get your local recreation centre to change their policy. Things like that. You can get, you know, I used to hate it, my, um, that sports centre. You could have parties there and they'd served up the crappiest food to your kids, soft drinks and sausage rolls and chips. It was like... I don't want to bring my own food. I'm not, I just wanted them to have a fun time, but I wanted them to have healthy food. Yeah. <laughs> there was no fruit platter, there was, there was nothing. So we all have a voice, we all have a sphere of influence. We can all change those little things uh, as we go through life. And then the bigger stuff, over to the government. Mm. Do the champions need to walk the talk? Oh, I struggle with this. I was going to go through menopause and lie on the couch and join the millions of others. <laughs> And um, then I met Rosemary Stanton. I don't know if you yeah. met Rosemary Stanton, but oh, she's awesome. And I thought, oh dear, my new role model. And so I just got on my bike. But it is very hard. I mean, when Nick Cormus talks about people who are above a healthy weight trying to, um, trying to eat well, I, I get it. It's hard. It's really hard. And I remember reading a, a piece about Susan Lee, and they followed her around her electorate. First of all, she doesn't eat sugar. Her father had diabetes, I think type 2 diabetes. And um, for lunch, she had a dim sim because it's all she could get. Mm -hmm. That's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a tragedy in a country town that all there was available on the weekend was a dim sim. And that's a lot of people's lives are like that. 
and a lot of people have never eaten healthily. 97% of people don't eat a healthy diet. So we've got a long way to go, but yeah, walking the walk. I mean, I didn't walk around too much because I was scared I would either. The other day I fell off the back of one of these. I mean, that was a whole new thing, <laughs> really. <laughs> it's fine to fall off the front, but so, anyway. But being active is important, so I just, I just ride my bike, I get on it, it doesn't matter if it's, I've done it in hail, it's very unpleasant, but I do that basically every day, yep, that's my thing. I'm really grateful to the person who submitted this question because I wanted, I'd forgotten to ask you this, why did you say we should target adolescents more than younger children in terms of turning things around? Well, um, I, I always think that's an interesting question, who should you target, where are the greatest gains? And, it was Barry's data, and now he's gone. So, um, but I saw one of his staff present that at um, uh, Australian New Zealand Obesity Society meeting, and because I always thought we should be intervening with children, with adolescents, um, boys first go through this huge weight gain when they leave school, and then women um, a little bit later. But you know, how do we? we it's it's massive. It's a huge. It's a huge increase, a bit like that's where the smoking prevalence went up in, in, in um, boys when they left school. So these adolescents are a really important group and they are totally ignored. But if you play it out through the system over time, that's where we should be intervening. And we have totally got our hands off the wheel with them. So how, how would we talk to them? Well, we're just doing a campaign actually with Rethink Sugary Drink um, that's targeting adolescent boys and you have to kind of go out of your comfort zone. <laughs> it doesn't appeal to me at all, so it's probably perfect. <laughs> but um, I think you need to be, it's, it's difficult. I, I think it can be a bit hit and miss, but we certainly should be ensuring that high schools are promoting healthy food. Uh, and that we don't forget about adolescents um, when we're trying to support them to go out into the world and be um, empowered to um, eat healthily. So we're looking at maybe reskinning this Food Sense program to make it attractive to um, to um, young boys when they're leaving school and starting to cook themselves. About you know because a lot of them don't have the resources to be able to cook and buy and prepare food. So if you can help them um, do that, I think that would be one way of empowering them. But all this marketing that they're getting, it's working. There's no need to cook. That's what the marketing says. Yeah, yeah. I was talking to journalist the other day, a young guy, and he goes, oh, I've just got a Domino's two for one on my phone. I was like, see, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, just this one final question. Shouldn't we spend a greater proportion of the government budget on prevention? Yes, it's cheap and worthwhile. Yes, we are very, very low in the proportion of funding that we spend on prevention. And I think it's very brave of the West Australian government to spend so much on the Live Lighter campaign, but it's very much worth it. And I think you could really leverage off that um, with more. But I think regulation is quite cheap. Mm. Jane, thank you so much. It's been a very energising conversation. Please thank Jane Martin. <laughs>
Um, in this session, I have gained permission from each of the participants not to go into lengthy bios, but you will see their bios in the program, so please have a look at those. I think you would have got one coming in the door. Um, each of the participants in this panel discussion is going to speak for seven minutes, uh, and then we're going to have a Q&A, and please keep feeding your questions in as we go. Um, Maurice Swanson is Chief Executive of the National Heart Foundation of WA. Ricky Burgess is the CEO of WOLGA, the WA Local Government Association, and Wendy Casey is the Director of Aboriginal Health at the Department of Health, WA. Please welcome them. <laughs> Maurice, over to you. Thanks, Mary. Um, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity, and um, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous owners of the land on which we're meeting this morning and pay my respects to the elders past and present. So just to start off with a couple of um, famous quotes, uh, one of which was um, mentioned by Jane, no single strategy will be effective and overnight success takes time. Uh, Professor Mike Daub, 1911. <laughs> and um, for those of you who know Mike, he looks remarkable for 107. <laughs> Another great quote, public regulation and market intervention are the only evidence-based strategies or mechanisms to prevent uh, harm caused by the unhealthy commodity industries. Professor Rob Moody in 2013. He made that quote before um, the evaluation of Live Lighter was about to be published, and you, you'll see that uh, number of publications of, of uh, now being uh, covered by um, peer-reviewed journals of the impact of Live Lighter. So if I leave you with only one message um, today, it's that if we're going to make any impact on obesity in this country, it has to be uh, a comprehensive approach with evidence-based strategies and not look for a magical silver bullet. There isn't one. Um, and I'm focusing here on a couple of things that the state government can do, and I'm going to go fairly quickly because Jane is psychic. Either that or she hacked into my computer system overnight and looked at my PowerPoint. So here are the five um, policy actions for obesity, and I'm going to go through them in serial order. And uh, Jane's touched on a few of them. So sustaining high impact, uh, effective campaigns and we have one in the state um, that's now been licensed uh, for use in several other states of Australia and territories. And uh, that was the opening outdoor billboard advertisement that we, that we uh, scheduled at the beginning of the campaign in, in Leaderville, which had uh, an amazing impact. Uh, but high impact, uh, sustained, uh, well-funded well campaigns are absolutely essential if we're going to do anything about obesity along with the other strategies that we'll talk about. Um, Jane mentioned um, the lack of health and wellbeing considerations as part of our planning codes and regulation. So in uh, WA we have a history of communities rising up against fast food outlets, Margaret River, Apple Cross, um, Guildford, and none of them um, can have um, the desired outcome on the basis of health and well-being impact because those considerations are not in the planning codes and that needs to change. Um, we also need a comprehensive walking and cycling strategy that promotes active travel and my colleague uh, Trevor Shilton provides this famous quote, drive, walk, bike or bus the choice looks simple to us. And uh, Trevor did some fantastic work in showing how many people can be moved around a city by various modes of transport. Um, he also makes the point that in the second most dangerous country in the world for gun deaths, Bogota, they've done it. Um, because we're often told that these system changes are very difficult. Well, if they're so difficult, how can this country have such amazing successes in moving people in these uh, forms of active transport. 
Um, Jane touched on this as well. We do need to restrict the availability sale of uh, sugary drinks. And in terms of WA, uh, the obvious um, fertile areas are state-owned and operated assets and events. I'm looking at Roger as I'm speaking, as well as at the screen, um, including hospitals and other health facilities. Uh, work with the facility uh, retailers to decrease the availability of these of these products and as Jane mentioned the work in Victoria shows that when you work with the uh, concession holders in these state-owned assets um, they don't lose turnover uh, especially if you engage them in the planning and implementation of, of the objective. Now here's a ripper that Jane um, has referred to and I'm just going to add a little bit of colour to this so here's the Australian Beverages Group's criticism of our esteemed minister. I think they referred to this august meeting as a sickly summit. And um, that, that wasn't surprising to anyone. I hope you all saw my quote in the West Australian. Um, I'll give a, an award to anyone who can repeat my quote. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Terry. So, uh, when we launched the sugary drinks phase of the um, Live Lighter campaign a couple of years ago, the Australian Beverages Council wrote to Kim Hames, the then minister, complaining about the lack of, lack of evidence that underpinned this campaign. And luckily for Kim, he just referred the correspondence through the health department to me to answer. So I had a, a very a good time, a humorous time, um, writing this letter where I asked uh, Jeff Parker on behalf really of one of his major uh, and most important members, Coca-Cola, could you please provide evidence published in a peer-reviewed journal that proves co Coca-Cola is happiness? And of course, I got no reply, but that's not surprising. <laughs> so these front groups um, are um, simply there to uh, prevent us from doing anything that's effective. Um, they, they lobby ferociously at the federal level and it's not therefore surprising that, uh, that uh, these regulatory changes are so difficult to achieve, but they're absolutely necessary. Jane touched on the ubiquity of marketing and advertising to kids. Um, it is everywhere. Uh, McDonald's is the uh, leading um, operator in the world of digital marketing to children. And I asked the question, do you really want Ronald McDonald to be the chief nutrition advisor to our children and adolescents? Well, I think the answer is simply no. Um, but, uh, but McDonald's has an amazingly good range of corporate strategies dare I mention, because I'll get stoned and hung, drawn and quartered, that um, what a brilliant strategy Ronald McDonald House is. I mean, who would argue about providing emergency accommodation for parents when their kids are sick? Not even I would argue against that. But whoever dreamed up that as a corporate relations strategy should be given a very large bonus. I'm sure they were. So we need to do something about advertising and marketing to kids, and most of those uh, regulatory changes would need to be uh, a Commonwealth and state uh, combined activity. Jane also touched on, as she hacked into my PowerPoint, self-regulation. Um, self-regulation is an absolute failure. It's written by the industry for the industry um, so that it's uh, guaranteed to be completely ineffective, but look at the happy faces there that were involved in that uh, formulation. It's wonderful stuff. So restricting children's exposure to unhealthy food advertising, I'm not going to read every one of those dot points. You can read a lot quicker than I can say the words, uh, but we do need a comprehensive approach and a key component of this is taking the regulatory stick to reducing exposure to junk food marketing for children. And finally, um, this is a great quote that I stole from Mike Daub, but he doesn't realise this. 
More deaths will be prevented by decisions taken at the cabinet table than at the surgical table. And Sir George Godber, Godbar, Godber uh, was, who was the British uh, chief medical officer um, for many years, um, made this statement. And it's a fantastic summary of uh, what we need to denormalize overweight and obesity and start to put downward pressure on the current prevalence trends. Um, incidentally, Sir George lived to, he was 100 and he nearly looked as good as Mike does uh, at the moment. So uh, some great steps in the last week, uh, not only with this, um, this summit, which is not sickly by the way, it's very positive, uh, the release, release of the Sustainable Health Review's interim report and it was just so positive to see that one of their leading priorities was keep people healthy and get serious about prevention and health promotion. And in getting serious, if I can just reiterate, we need a comprehensive approach, we need evidence-based strategies, we need joined up thinking, not just in the health department, we need it across government. And if we can get a whole of government KPI on ob obesity, with a, uh, a comprehensive policy uh, that lists the strategies that are going to be given not only funding but priority, then I think we've got a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maurice. Ricky Burgess, CEO of Volga. Oh, thank you. you so much. I want to know why you kept looking to me every time you talked about planning. I don't sure. know. Oh, you don't know? No, no don't. I'll keep it for you. Um, I don't uh, have any slides, but look, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to represent, if you like, local government's interest in this question. It's such a big question and such a big issue, and it was really um, rewarding for me to hear Jane's uh, comments about working together. And I thought that um, sectors working together is really the answer. Um, we know that um, the issue, uh, working alone is just not possible. Um, we know that there's such huge funding issues and uh, we've all got that. It's not, it's not uh, in the area of just state. I mean, local government suffers the same thing. And we're all struggling to find ways to make things work. And so mine's a fairly simple message here today. I, I will give a couple of examples. But the, um, the very simple message is that local government's a conduit. It's an, an enabler. And if we are able to um, work together and collaboratively on these issues, I think we've got a far better chance of getting some successful outcomes. And I know at the moment, for instance, um, there is a, st uh, a state government, local government partnership, and the Department of Local Government is demonstrating some very effective ways of enabling us to achieve more than we could possibly ever have done um, either one of us working alone. So I just want to put that to you, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of, of how that um, comes about. For me, uh, working as the CEO of a peak body, it is engaging with our local governments, and it's great to see we have a couple of our CEOs here today from Armidale and Coburn. Now, I'll talk about um, an, uh, perhaps a an example from Wanneroo that started in Coburn that's a really good example of how we can all come together to make these things uh, a reality. And so uh, um, that's a good place to be in my role as CEO there. But I'm also on the board of Healthway, which is fantastic. Great to see some of our board members here today. And uh, also on Mercy Care. So I have a passionate interest in, in health, but uh, seeing uh, the experts here, that's not my job today. It's just really to talk about local government. One of the things that there exists in local government is something called a strategic community plan. Now, the good thing about that is there, that this is legislated. There is a requirement for local governments to do that and uh, to have this. And so that enables them to connect with the community, to talk about what the community is interested in, to talk about a community's long-term vision and uh, their aspirations, the values. And so, as we've already seen, the community supports healthy living. Um, 
mums want this, um, and they're a big, big voice out in the community. So it, it is something that uh, local governments work with, and it helps them develop a, what's called a community profile, if you like, and it's the basis that they use for planning, for programming and reporting. And so perhaps you're saying, well, what does that, you know, what does that actually mean for me? I'm not in local government. Uh, this plan is uh, what local governments use to engage with their community, as I've said, and it enables those voices to be heard and it begins the process of um, perhaps developing and forming this plan. And that sets the tone for the next or the plan for the next 10 years. So it's a great uh, point for everyone to be aware of and to perhaps an entry point to get in and work with them on what's, what is for the common good in terms of health and benefiting uh, local communities. There are three things that local governments do all day, every day, and those things are about policy development. The peak body, WELGA, works on policy development all the time and so we're intensely interested and acutely interested in what's happening in the health plans of um, Western Australia. Um, local governments every day in their own um, areas are working on uh, policy. Infrastructure and creating supportive environments and so um, we, we heard comments about planning and that's a critical point of uh, local government's responsibility and programs and services that assist and support positive health behaviours and decisions. So when those components, those three things, um, there are lots of other things, but particularly those things, when they're working together, they can create great spaces and places and reflect policies that encourage good behaviour. And uh, perhaps when I speak of the exemplar of your move, Wanneroo, I'll say more about that. So the Public Health Act and public health planning includes processes that impact on health and wellbeing outcomes and related processes that allow the development of a local government response. And as I've said, I can't see how into the future, working alone and working in absence of each other, um, this joined up approach that we talk about, unless we uh, are able to get over the, the sort of isolation and the silos that we work within, unless we can overcome that and work together, I can't see how we're gonna go forward. So uh, for me, that's a, a very big um, issue. So this business about it in practice, so prevention, promotion, partnerships, working to together, uh, that working group, we had some exemplars presented there, and as I mentioned, I think it was 2.13, 2.14 in Coburn, um, they started this process about your move uh, Coburn, which led on to uh, Wanneroo doing this. So just to give you an example so you can hear what I'm, and understand what I'm talking about, it was an innovative physical activity and active transport behaviour change, um, this uh, project that was managed collaboratively by the Department of Sport and Recreation and the Department of Transport. And this Your Move uh, Wanneroo program integrated the most successful elements of Transport's Travel Smart program and the Sport and Recreation's Active Smart program. And it applied sophisticated and informed behaviour change methodology, offering individualised active lifestyle coaching, transport infrastructure upgrades, community services to households, schools and businesses within a local government area setting. Partnering with local government in a defined area was a key to success to the ongoing sustainability of behaviour change um, and this particular project. So using local government's strengths there, uh, in policy development and infrastructure planning and creating supportive environments, it's essential to this sort of program model. So your move Wanneroo in the city of Wanneroo from April to December 2015 was offered to all 64,000 households with a recruitment target of 10,500 households registered. The key objectives of the project were to increase the level of physical activity, increase levels of participation in local sporting clubs and active uh, recreation groups and programs, increase the number of car trips swapped for um, active modes of transport such as walking, cycling and public transport, and increase community connectedness. The take-home success points of this project model that are relevant for today's discussion 
collaborative effort between state government, local government, not-for-profit groups. Also, high level of service unit involvement across the city of Wanneroo, involving nine of their different service units. So there was a behaviour change approach. It incorporated proven behaviour change principles and key principles of um, behaviour change included goal setting, localised personal in uh, personalised information, social motivation, support, connectedness to uh, community, cross-community projects, schools, workplaces, two tiers of government, and that was also aligned with uh, active transport infrastructure and programs, vouchers, HBF fitness, bike workshops. So this was all critically important to the outcome. Ongoing healthy public policy uh, development. It continues to support good decision making both within and external to that city and it creates sustainable, supportive uh, components, environments and behaviours. So how do we know that that worked? How do we know that it was a success? Well, we know that because they surveyed the residents and in evaluation there, the, the uh, responses that came back were with regard to physical activity and improvement in that, active transport use, awareness of those programs, facilities and parks in the city of Wanneroo and the community around there, and awareness of infrastructure, that is things like wayfinding signs, bike repair stations, etc. So local governments are, are your conduit. You can use them, you can develop programs and um, these processes and use local governments to connect and find your way through to better outcomes. It uh, doesn't matter where you are in Western Australia, there's a structure that can ensure consistency in delivery. Uh, that's through the um, strategic community plan, through public health plans, collaborative partnerships. Local governments are conduit that can connect you and it's intensely, local governments intensely focused on being responsive to their communities. When they're not, we see what happens. Uh, unfortunately, it's in the media every day, in fact, today. And uh, it, it also, of course, includes their um, health and wellbeing outcomes. So, as I said, local government is here uh, waiting and wants to be connected and work with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricky. Um, Wendy, you might want to just Wendy yes. might want to just bring your microphone around in front of you a bit more. Yeah. How's that? Please welcome Wendy Casey. Thank you. First, can I also acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we meet, the Wajjup people, and pay respect to my elders, past and present. Um, I, I, I'm a bit out of my comfort zone, I have to say. Um, I'm not a specialist in obesity, uh, particularly according to my BMI. And, um, but I do know a little bit about Aboriginal health, and I guess that's why I'm here. I uh, had an interesting conversation with a former colleague earlier on who reminded me of when I ran out of a conference once with a lapel mic on, standing outside going, why the beep was I invited to this? <laughs> but I actually can actually quote that this morning on the ABC radio, I was quoted as, as saying um, how excited I am to be here. <laughs> uh, and I really am, so let's move on. Um, let's start to contextualise from an Aboriginal cultural perspective around obesity. And the only place we can start with is life expectancy. We know that our people in Western Australia for men are 15.1 years lower and women are 13.5 years lower than non-Aboriginal people. And a lot of what contributes to this gap is obesity and chronic disease management, uh, or chronic diseases in general. Um, we also know we're slightly higher, obviously, than mainstream West Australians, but about the same around 67% uh, of Aboriginal people living in WA are obese or overweight. And about a third of our kids are considered overweight or obese. So these issues are concerning. And overall, we're about 1.6 times 
more likely to be obese than non-Aboriginal people. Um, we know that chronic diseases play a large part in Aboriginal life expectancy. We know what the different conditions are that you can get for being obese, but for Aboriginal people, the rates of these chronic diseases are much, much higher. Diabetes, end-stage kidney, cardiovascular disorders, we have got big issues in the community. We also know that chronic diseases are responsible for around 64% of the total disease burden for Aboriginal people. Um, and that's about you know, 2.8 times higher than for non-Aboriginal people. But more importantly, and it's already been discussed this morning around the social determinants have a huge impact on the Aboriginal community. We have overcrowded housing, about 24% of our people live in overcrowded housing versus about 4% of non-Aboriginal people and the rates are much higher in remote areas. We have very high rates of unemployment and our kids are behind the eight ball in terms of getting year 12 attainment, although that has been improving. Uh, evidence is emerging, if we can get our kids to finish year 12, then we're going to really improve health and wellbeing outcomes and their children will have a better life. Um, we also know that 37% overall of burden of disease could be avoided if we reduce these risk factors in the Aboriginal community, including high body mass, physical inactivity and poor diet. So there's some of the evidence. Um, but what else do we need to know? And maybe a bit of a focus first on what traditional life was like for Aboriginal people before colonisation. Our people worked collectively. We looked after each other. We looked after our country. We had sophisticated knowledge of the seasons and securing our own food supplies. And we also know that traditional foods were very high in protein, low in sugars, high in micronutrients and high in complex carbohydrates. So our food base was very nutritional. Hunting and gathering is really hard work. Lots of activity and, um, and people had a role and function in life. So our fitness was maintained and we had a purpose. Our Leon was strong. Leon being a Yaru term for well-being. And when your uh, well-being is strong, it means you're connected to your family, community and country and culture. Um, we took only what we needed, needed. There was no opportunities to overeat. We made sure that we had rituals and ceremonies that kept our country alive and ensured a, a good food supply. And that seemed to work pretty well for thousands of years. But we know the impact of colonisations had a huge devastating effect on the health and wellbeing of Aboriginal people. And very briefly, if I can in a minute, we had legislation that took over Aboriginal people's lives, dispossessed us from our country and even took away our children. And there is a historical element to understanding nutrition from an Aboriginal context. A Western diet was imposed and it wasn't like they were skipping along giving us a nice basket full of fruit and vegetables. It was probably the staples that aren't very good for us and they were often used as payment for very, very hard work. So flour, tea, sugar, salt, all was imposed. The overall dependence during the colonisation phase um, that we had to start to rely on the dominant culture because we weren't allowed to practice our own ways um, has actually led to some of the issues we see today. Roles changed uh, dramatically for men and women. Women were no longer able to feed their children in the ways that they always have. That's provided that their children weren't taken away. So today we can look at obesity as being one of the past and present unintended consequences of oppression. 
Disadvantage in general is very complex in Aboriginal communities. That's already been spoken about this morning. Um, we have, in, and, and, and we need to, no one single solution is going to actually, um, we need to be doing multiple things to make a difference. Um, often you hear about uh, what the cause is from a biological medical type model used to get this a lot when I worked in the drug and alcohol field as well. Um, and no one wants to minimise medical biological models, but I think we really need to look at obesity through the lens of environmental factors in our community and the accumulated effects of history. Uh, we also know that getting good quality food up into remote areas sometimes can be a bit tricky, particularly when the whole area is flooding, as it has been in recent times. And we also know that we need fresh food to be affordable for our people in communities. Um, I, I guess obesity has to be seen as part of disadvantage overall for Aboriginal people. So what do we need to do in terms of strengthening the cultural determinants of health for Aboriginal people with a prevention lens? Now, the cultural determinants are really important. I spoke earlier about the social determinants, which are usually the negative impacts that have on health. The cultural determinants are actually the things that are strengths-based and how we can start to build further resilience in the community. Culture must be central to prevention initiatives targeting Aboriginal people. Aboriginal community control engagement and leadership is absolutely critical to developing local-based solutions. We need to ensure that individual family and community responsibility, where people are engaged and respectful of the need to be accountable as a collective for Aboriginal health and wellbeing. Caring for country is really important and participation in cultural activities is really important and maintaining or even reclaiming um, our access to traditional foods. And most importantly, for the cultural determinants, we need to ensure that we can live a life free from discrimination in Australian society. And we've got a bit of work to do yet. There are opportunities because I said that on the radio this morning because I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> and some of those opportunities, oh God, I go loud and soft. Um, some of those opportunities is about how we continue to further build those partnerships and ongoing collaboration with the Aboriginal community. And we must have culturally secure, evidence-based programs to address obesity. Um, Community-based and family-focused approaches is critical to prevention and we need to have a broader restoration of health for family and community wellbeing um, across the country. Um, of course, most importantly, particularly in line with the interim report being released this week for the Sustainable Health Review, <clears throat> we need to improve health outcomes for Aboriginal West Australians and support a sustainable WA health system because there's going to be lots of economic gains if we can get this right, if we can get the right balance. Currently, tertiary systems, so many of our people are in them with chronic disease management, it's very costly. We get so focused on managing chronic disease, we sometimes forget about what we need to be doing in the prevention space and including investment. We need to improve and extend targeted prevention programs, including being involved in population, mainstream population-based Y programs as well. Um, but we also need targeted programs. One of the better programs that um, I've seen targeted statewide for Aboriginal people was done by the drug and alcohol area. Um, is the Strong Spirit, Strong Future campaign with Mary G. There's no reason we can't put Mary G on a diet. <laughs> and, and do something similar from a health perspective. Um, we also need to get 
to build the capacity of our people to understand better choices and demand for healthy food. We need to have good health literacy resources. We need to be engaging more with families and communities. Some great programs have occurred and we need to continue to build and expand on what those programs are. And particularly in remote communities has been the Outback Stores program. There's uh, several in Western Australia, but the majority are in Northern Territory, about 36 programs altogether, who run fantastic programs in remote communities in terms of uh, running the shop, you know, d water is a dollar, cool drinks down the back and they cost more. Uh, those types of strategies, employment strategies attached to them as well, um, not marketing confectionery chips and those sorts of things at the shops. Uh, in 1617, uh, the, their evaluation demonstrated that those out of those 36 that had a huge drop in selling sugary drinks, and I think this is a, an amazing figure, but um, a reduction of about 11.5 tonnes of sugar through the reduction of not selling sugary drinks, which is, means 11.5 tonnes of sugar that our mob didn't get to consume. Um, and of course, finally, we need to continue that across government commitment to address the social determinants of health for Aboriginal people. It cannot be done in isolation. Uh, it's absolutely critical that we're working together. So I guess on that note, I would like to say a little Garajati phrase, Waraja Nalu Wanduna, which roughly translates to one spirit, one feeling, or working together. And in Ingrid's words this morning, in the spirit of reconciliation, we need a collective approach to improve Aboriginal health and wellbeing outcomes. Thank you, Wendy, so much. Um, let's stick with that thought, though, in terms of how we can come together as a community, because I've, that was really a theme in, in all three of your presentations. Um, and there are a couple of questions that have come up that are to do with resourcing. So I'm going to ask both of them as they've been posed. And although they're different, they are kind of the same um, thing because they're about what you need. Um, Wendy, how can we attract and what would it take to support the training of Aboriginal people to become dietitians and nutritionists? as they do in Queensland. Um, and the other question, which I saved from the last session, um, oh, has someone taken it away? Uh, do, do we have the public health and health promotion workforce capacity within WA Health to address this at a local and regional level? So it's resourcing questions for each of you, but I'll start, Wendy, with that question directed to you. It's a really good question. I, I, I guess one of our key focuses is growing and developing the Aboriginal workforce across the state, and it's certainly a priority of the Department of Health, um, and, and, and certainly growing people in the dietitian space is really, really important. Um, the numbers that we get out of the tertiary system are improving greatly, but perhaps not at the speed sometimes you would like in terms of, um, you know, once you've got one, they're gone <laughs> off somewhere else and, and, and you know, that sort of thing. But um, building the capacity and growing the workforce is really critical mm -hmm. and building the capacity of the skill sets of, in, in the health promotion prevention area is also really critical. Um, there's a range of different ways that can be done. You don't have to go to uni. We can build people's uh, skills and competency using certificate vet sector mm -hmm. training as well, which then becomes a pathway for them to go to university as well. We've done a lot of that sort of work in the drug and alcohol sector in, in doing certificate um, courses, so people have the skills to work in that space. Mm -hmm. I think the same can be done in this space. But I encourage any opportunity to grow the tertiary uh, and, and, and vet sector workforce for our people. Uh, but there's one thing you need to do when you grow that workforce, you actually have to employ them. Mm. <laughs> and it'd be really good if we could employ some more. Mm. 
So, Ricky, from your perspective, uh, you, you know, local governments have got a mandate to, to you know, work in, in this health and wellbeing mm. sector, but how well resourced are you to deliver meaningful things like the program that you talked about that originated in Coburn mm. and went to Wanneroo? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for that um, question. Well, I think one of the, the um, biggest concerns that we have as money has become scarce in state government and some of those services and things that were being delivered can no longer be delivered and so the community looks to local government. Now speaking to my colleagues uh, Ray Tame and Stephen Kane outside and saying that the big issue for us uh, are or the big, one of the biggest issues is that is it about our interest, our willingness, our taking responsibility, wanting to do these um, projects? Of course not, absolutely not. We're, we're um, deeply committed to it, but it is a lack of resourcing. So I, I've been able to observe just generally as funds have um, decreased just in other groups that I'm involved with, that the only way that they, uh, for instance, in the not-for-profits working in health, aged care or any of um, those areas, the only way they've been able to do it is to cobble together a number of groups in order to um, be able to take on those projects. So funding is and resources is and will be a big issue and as I said, the only way that I see that we can achieve it is by working together and so we fortunately we have a fantastic relationship with the Department of Health we've on many committees and uh, we we do I'm just looking at Taran now we uh, are able to um, pick up issues and projects and work out ways that we can deliver the best to our ability but I don't think I'd be fooling anybody by saying that uh, it's easy or it, I mean, we just have to continue to do the best that we can with what we've got and uh, join up in order to make that happen. Maurice, have you made observations in, in your role about how resourcing is affecting our ability to deliver some of these, uh, the things we'd like to deliver in terms of uh, obesity prevention? Well, just a couple of comments. Um, was touched on earlier by Barry, I think, that um, um, the allocation of resources for dedicated prevention is, is at an all-time low. I think it's 1.5% of total outlays for health in Australia um, this year. And um, it used to be, um, under the previous um, government, uh, as high as 2.5 with the public health agreements. And um, that's nowhere near enough. It doesn't compare favourably with other countries like Canada and New Zealand, for example. Um, but if we have proper resourcing, then you can complement the regulatory and policy environment with tailored programs. And perhaps the best, most recent example for me is the Tackling Indigenous Smoking program that was refunded by Ken White in the last uh, week or so. We're seeing some really good progress in reducing the prevalence of smoking among Aboriginal people right across Australia. Obviously, there are differences in the prevalence in some communities, but we've seen a steady decline in adults. Um, and that's a combination of the population-wide measures that affect everyone, regardless of whether they're Indigenous or not, together with the really appropriate tailored interventions engaging with the community, put together by Aboriginal people and uh, put together by consulting the communities that they're trying to have an impact on. Mm -hmm. Right at the end of your address, Maurice, you were talking about it being a priority, um, which I think is kind of a key word because I know that today we're gathered here for the purpose of starting a conversation. But in, when you look back now, when is the last time you felt that that these issues of obesity and, and this afternoon alcohol were a priority for either a WA state government or an Australian government? Well, I think that, um, first of all, the, the state government of, of both persuasions um, have been interested in making a, a very substantial investment in addressing obesity. Um, as Jane mentioned, um, the Live Lighter campaign is, is unique. 
It's been ad uh, adopted in a couple of other states and territories, not to the same funding level, but they've certainly used the resources and paid licence fees. That's encouraging. Um, Jane mentioned that Nicola Roxon got completely different messages about what to do on obesity. No one could come up with a consensus. That's changed now with um, tipping the, help me, Maria? Scales. Scales. We've got a consensus list of policy objectives there. Um, unfortunately, at the Commonwealth level, um, they've dropped the ball on, on prevention, but it's just so encouraging to see the interim report of the Sustainable Health uh, Review, uh, as I mentioned, um, giving priority to, to prevention. That now needs to be matched with the additional resources and, um, and linking up across government departments so that all government departments, all local government instrumentalities can make a contribu uh, contribution to, to reducing the prevalence. And uh, um, Ricky mentioned some very good case studies where Coburn and Wanneroo have been involved in that. They're at the coalface, they're working with their communities, they complement the media campaign, it's all consistent. Mm -hmm. And what we need now is some policy grunt from the politicians. Um, there's a question here that says, what do local governments need to do to best leverage Live Lighter? Um, I'm wondering whether Maurice or Ricky is more inspired to respond mm. to that question. To, to leverage? To leverage Live Lighter. I'm not quite sure that um, I, I need to think about it, but I'm, I've been attracted. I will answer that in answering. I think this. I can see a second question <laughs> there, which sort of is around the same thing. I think around um, initiating um, a, a peep of policy around food and nutrition. So I think it's around the same thing. I think our policy people um, need to continue to work with key people in the Department of Health, uh, Healthway and other areas where they are able to focus on developing uh, strategies like uh, Morris has just suggested. But one of the things that comes to my mind just immediately is the a guide for alcohol um, outlets that was developed through policy work. Um, by our group, and I think there's opportunity there to develop um, through our policy work a guide for fast food outlets, and I'm sure that will have a very positive impact. So I think there's much more to this question that's not in my mind at the moment, but happy to think about it further if something comes up. I'll... Can I add, I think it's really essential that um, the state government work with local government to give you planning approval um, to take into yeah. account the health impact of, of um, uh, the, the mm. building number of, of these fast food outlets. I mean, yeah. uh, when we were working uh, with the people in, in Guildford, um, you know, there are some er parts of the me metropolitan area that, um, that uh, are not high income areas where they are overloaded with um, with fast food outlets, and they know what they're doing. They're targeting those populations that are least able to resist their marketing and their pricing. So marketing, pricing, availability. And um, we heard from, from Jane that the majority of people want to do the right thing by their families. They want to do the right thing by their kids, um, but where um, we're undermining that motivation by not assisting them to change the environment in which they're making those choices. So there's a huge amount of work that we could do to make the environment more, more supportive of their, of their motivations. Yeah, you'll only get 100% <laughs> agreement and support from me on that issue. I, uh, um, planning, the planning issues are huge and uh, our guys continue to uh, knock on that door and try and make inroads. And uh, in, interestingly, in our own organisation, not necessarily in councils, but in our own organisation, it is the community uh, unit and the planning unit that work together because they cross over so much. And this is, as you say, a huge issue. Uh, we recognise it and we're continuing to try and influence and uh, make some inroads. And I think that there are two things I'd say. Yes, 
um, the people who are most at, uh, at risk and in, in poorer groups and sort of situations um, are having the marketing focus put on them. But it's also, and I know from personal experience um, with my own family, uh, one of my sons and his wife are in that sort of situation. And sometimes the only thing they can do and the only uh, thing they can afford is a McDonald's and it just distresses me greatly, but that's their gift in a way, which um, I heard Jane talk about, I, it just breaks my heart. Um, but So I, I understand what you're saying. It's, it's hard to understand when you talk about something as simple as just changing the planning laws that, I mean, how difficult is that? Very. Why? Why is it? <laughs> Oh, look, it would take me too long and there, uh, there are so many vested interests and different um, groups that are involved in that and even when you get it right, people object and it goes to another body to overturn. I mean, it is a very complex area and I'm really not qualified to answer that. Wendy, is there already collaboration with local governments um, for, with Aboriginal communities to address some of these health issues? Mm. Certainly in different areas and you know, some, some work better than others um, and, and you do find uh, in the sort of more regional areas that there's quite good working relationships. Um, but, but I think there's the opportunity for greater collaboration and support working in those spaces and, 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 and councils employing more Aboriginal people as well uh, to work in this space is really important. Um, could I answer? Yes. Uh, just one thing I'd, I'd like to say. Um, local government has teamed up with Main Roads and we are involved in a small group called Nudge. I don't know if you've heard about them. Sorry, which group? Nudge. Nudge. They used to be Roads Foundation and their uh, reason for being is to work with Aboriginal youth and uh, create opportunities for them to get work in local governments. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, that is being quite successful. So maybe we can hook up and talk Absolutely. about that later. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about how can we change urban design to support healthier lifestyles and bring people closer to knowing their sources of food and getting active. Mm. Maurice, have you got a strong view? Well, I think I think there's a, a really obvious trend in the community, or at least in those in middle and higher incomes, yeah. towards um, fresh uh, food markets, local markets. Um, of course. Um, I haven't got the stats in front of me, but I imagine that Coles and Woolies still provide the bulk of fruit and vegetables to Australians. But there's certainly a trend in um, buying produce from those sorts of outlets. And uh, many of the providers provide that link to where the food is grown. And I, th I think that's encouraging. Um, it's, I think it's a good sign. I don't think it's the, the complete answer, but um, it, would be, it would be good if we could harness the Coles and Woolworths, I know there are other players entering the market now, but if we could get them more focused on, on health uh, rather than flogging rubbish and, and uh, marketing it with great skill at end of aisles. When I walk around the supermarket, every end of aisle yeah. promotion is absolute crap. Mm. Um, and you need to avoid them and perhaps avoid most of the supermarket. <laughs> Um, getting closer to food source is something that you talked about, Wendy, though, with traditional foods. And there, there are some community garden schemes. Yes, there the, are. Yeah, There's an EON program that's been running um, a, a program in remote communities in building sustainable gardens, but it's quite a comprehensive program. It's not just about growing, it's about understanding how to prepare the food as well as, well as education about nutritional foods and so on. Um, and they include some, you know, traditional foods and bush medicine and those sorts of things as well. Um, and people feel really good when they grow something, grow mm. your own. Mm. They used to say back in the 70s. Um, anyway, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I'm not here for the alcohol and drug session. That's for another summit, Wendy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because I was reflecting when you were talking about, the, you know, the, the tragedy of the, the, the lost traditional life and how, um, you know, what was interesting about this, this story and the opportunity with Aboriginal people is that while it's incredibly tragic, it also feels like there's quite a lot of hope there in terms of potential for community cohesion and to really turn things around. Is that me imagining things? Or? No, absolutely. There's some really good examples out there of 
um, local communities uh, doing absolute great work and, and you know, reclaiming language um, and reclaiming culture and still uh, being engaged in, you know, traditional hunting, gathering, if you like, and, and sharing that with the children and, and uh, you know, some of the bush fruits in Aboriginal community is amazing. Like, there's a little bush fruit from where my mob are from called Gubbinge that's got one of the highest sources of vitamin C. I mean, you know, this is really nutritional food and, and people are doing well. It's not, it's hard to, with the data, not everyone's in doom and gloom. Mm. We can't ignore those who are. Mm. Um, there's a question about uh, education for and about healthier living is mandated but not prioritised in schools. How can we get a better match between schools and action? Maurice, I feel like education is your department. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for handing me the grenade. Um, yeah. um, I would caution that, um, you know, we, we need to focus on just one strategy. Um, I think, if anything, there's been a, a drop-off in the emphasis on health promotion, health education in schools. We used to lead the the country, the nation, we used to lead the world in, in that regard. But I think, unfortunately, with the pressures on schools to teach everything, every topic um, known to man, that that, um, that priority has dropped off. Um, so, uh, in fact, we even used to have ACHPA running a survey um, every couple of years to measure uh, how, what was being taught, how much was being taught, what teachers were involved in the teaching of, of health. Uh, that seems to have gone by the wayside many years ago. Mm. So I'm not confident that um, placing all of our eggs in that basket is the solution. I think that we need to improve it, certainly, but it needs to be part of that comprehensive approach that I was talking about. Mm. Um, I will just take one final question. I think this will be for you, Wendy. Um, how do we strengthen and foster Aboriginal control in healthcare and prevention? What best practice models exist? Look, absolutely, definitely, we have to remain engaged with the Aboriginal community, consult with the Aboriginal community mm. and have leadership coming from the Aboriginal community. They're, they're critical mm. principles in the way we should work. Um, and we need to all be doing that, mm. not just the Aboriginal Health Policy Directorate from the Department of Health, but across health and across other areas need to be doing that work, like local council and so on as well. Um, absolutely critical. Aboriginal people actually do know what we need and we need to be supported in being able to uh, do what we need to do in partnership and collaboration with the broader community mm. and with the resources to do that. Mary, could I just add one other thing? While I've been sitting here, I've got three messages on my phone. One was to stand up. The other one was to quieten my mind and shut up. And the third, the third was an ABC News alert regarding the recall of uh, Takata airbags, which is a current story at the moment. They have caused one possible death in Australia. One, and they're recalling 330,000 cars because of the potential risk. Mm. And we've got an obesity epidemic and we're all sitting here and saying, oh, why can't the government pass this or that regulation? I think it's just incredible. And it just shows you how we've got to get a lot better at our advocacy to government yes. uh, in a combined way to create some change here. That's an extraordinary way to wrap up the session. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you to Maurice Swanson, Ricky Burgess and Wendy Casey. And I'll just invite Professor Jonathan Carapetis to the stage, please. Thank you again. Ooh.
You're right with that microphone. Yeah, it's fine. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'll speak up. <laughs> um, Professor Jonathan Karapetis is director of the Telethon Kids Institute, which you will know is WA's largest medical research organisation. He's a paediatrician and infectious diseases specialist whose research interests and focus in his current role is all about better health outcomes in the future for kids and ultimately for their families as well, including through research programs in nutrition, diabetes and obesity. Please welcome him. I thought it would be really interesting to get your reactions on some of the key things that have come up in the, the sessions this morning. And um, the first one was about the, the question that uh, Barry actually put up about whether we were using data well enough. Yeah. Um, and we, we kind of said, well, we may be a little bit fair good. We were in that kind of department. Are we, how well are you using data and, and how's it working for you? Really well. Um, we are... <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's the basis of who we are. We're a research organisation. So I think probably most importantly is how can we provide data to others to use it to do useful things, such as make policy, improve practice. Um, and that's something that we're trying to do much better at. Um, we, we've, we've had a long-standing relationship with policymakers, service providers in this state nationally. Um, we've been around for getting close to 30 years trying to do that. Um, but in the past, I think researchers have tended to live in their research academic bubble far too much. They've tended to use data to focus on peer-reviewed journal publications, for example, which are you know, incredibly important and wonderful markers of excellence, but probably mean very little to a lot of the people in the room here. What's more important is how we then take the next step, which is to make sure that evidence is relevant and useful and provided to people who can use it. Uh, and that's something that we've been, particularly over the last few years, working much harder at. And I guess the, the, the epitome of, of how we've done that in the past and how we're going to try and do it better in the future is, is data linkage, which, um, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and Western Australia has led the country, and indeed in many ways led the world in data linkage in the past. Um, over the past probably decade, we've gradually come back to the pack. We've had a data linkage review which has been released by government, uh, which really outlines a, a, um, a plan for how we can return to that leadership role and really use the existing data much more effectively. And I, and I think that's what Barry was trying to say uh, in, many, in many aspects. We, we need to get that thing implemented and use the data, and that's where organisations like us can, if you like, come behind those making policy. Yeah. So across what you've heard this morning, uh, I mean, has, has it all resonated with your views and experiences? Has it been a matter of kind of sitting here vehemently agreeing with everything? Yes, with one minor exception, which I'll get onto in a sec. Um, but what, what has been really intriguing for me, and the thing that probably has preoccupied my thinking a lot um, in the last couple of hours, listening to what we've heard, is you know, the point's been made. We've got lots of evidence. We're all, I think, in furious agreement um, around the fact that something needs to be done, and we've got a pretty clear idea about what needs to be done. Um, what I don't think we've really nailed is why isn't it being done? And um, and in a way, that's why it's probably quite good, because we could have a chat because the minister's left the room. Um, <laughs> although I noticed that one of his people's here, so we'll, we'll be careful. Um, but, you know, I'm just trying to understand, and there's, there's a lot of you in the room who know more about this than me, about what's going through his mind and what's going through the minds of a new government. This is such an opportunity with a new government, and the, and the people I've met in this government, by and large, are incredibly devoted to trying to do something useful to take the opportunity to set a new course. Um, I think we've heard very clearly the message that, that this, you know, focusing on a, a, a comprehensive approach that is quite bold around obesity would be electorally incredibly appealing. Um, and so if you ask me, it's not an issue of should we do it and would that be a really good thing for our standing in the community? It's me having to personally understand better why wouldn't it happen? What's stopping this government from doing the eight things that, that, live, that have been outlined and, and that Maurice also outlined? What, what really is stopping that from happening right now? Because if you're willing to take on the commercial interests, which I, th I think is probably the, the one message we're getting, that's the big block. If you're willing to take them on and you, you accept that the economic um, that in fact the, there will be economic benefit from doing this, not economic loss from doing this, 
then just be bold. And that's what I, I really, I would hope out of this, it's not just preaching to the converted and we, we just say, yes, we'd like to do something and then one or two small things is done. It's what, what opportunity does a state have to do, even if the Commonwealth decides they're not gonna, they're gonna drop the ball? Why, what's stopping a state from saying, well, we're gonna do whatever we can in the meantime? And, and that's, that's probably what I'm not quite getting. So who do you appoint as the champion? Um, well, we, we have a minister here who has clearly convened this summit, who from what I'm gathering is wanting to do something significant. Um, I think you need, and this is, uh, this is where I'm interested in Jane's views also on the task force. So there's this idea of in, you know, one of the eight national um, aims is to have a task force. Now, task forces come and go, and I've been part of task forces that have been incredibly frustrating because they don't have teeth, and then there, there, no, there are no indicators, there are no targets, etc. Um, so why don't you do that in Western Australia and say, let's have a, a Western Australian um, obesity task force and let's, let's identify the, 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 the comprehensive strategy. But within the comprehensive strategy, you've got to identify some really big ticket items you can tick off and let's set some targets to it. I think that's the sort of thing that gets people excited rather than, um, than the tinkering at the edges, which we can continue to do with, with some fantastic initiatives like Live Lighter, that's, that's great. But, you know, in itself, it's not doing what we need it to do, which has really changed the whole paradigm in this state. Mm. I want to go down to some more kind of nitty gritty stuff, um, particularly where well, we've, we've talked about children quite a few times. And one of the questions, which I haven't got anything on my screen at the moment, I'm hoping that's right. I asked, I asked it. In terms of, uh, can I? Oh, you, yeah. oh, you <laughs> asked it, did you? It was a plant. Um, it was not, yeah, well, I, I, I'm glad you picked it up. Um, <laughs> so it's the question that, uh, just picking up Jane's comment around um, we should be targeting adolescents in preference to young children. And, and that's, uh, so I'm gonna try and re reword the answer because I'm sure that's not what you meant. Um, <laughs> which is to say that, and I couldn't agree more that, that in public health in general, we, and indeed in health in general, we have completely neglected adolescents. We've completely neglected young people. And, and I work in an area, a particular disease called rheumatic heart disease where there's a perfect example of that. Um, but it's true of mental health, it's true of, of drugs and alcohol, it's true of obesity, nutrition, you know, the list will go on. So I think what you're saying is that we have to make sure that that, that is a significant part of whatever our response is. Because there's no doubt that as you go through the life course, your chance of making a biggest difference to outcome as an adult starts prenatally. Um, it begins in those first couple of years, and that's where the biggest chance of making a difference is. It gradually reduces. By the time you get out of adolescence, you've kind of lost the chance to do something significant at a population level. That's not to mean that there are not gonna be individuals who can be turned around. But we heard in the opening remarks that when it comes to tobacco, your chance of actually stopping someone smoking is so much less than stopping them starting in the first place. So my feeling is that that there's, well, I can give you reams of evidence that we need to be focusing in young children and obviously the environment in which they live, which is, also includes focusing on parents and families. That's the most important. We've got, um, I think the figures are 30% of two to five year olds in Western Australia don't get the recommended amounts of physical activity. 20% are already overweight and obese. Mm. So the pattern is set then. Intervene then, but don't lose track of the fact that, yes, there's also this additional transitional period in life, which is adolescence, when you've got another chance to do something significant. Mm. And is that a reasonable summary of... Is that good. the answer you wanted to give? <laughs> <laughs> how effective are kids at kind of creating new thinking inside families, like where the children are bringing home the messages and their new messages to the parents, but it can really transform a family? It, limited, um, because it's usually the parents and the family that parents set the example and uh, uh, in fact the kids usually respond to the environment around them. What kids can do, and this is, this is another really difficult balancing act that I have as a parent, is they can introduce some, some interesting technological solutions. And there are some really interesting technologies. Um, and, and a lot of the discussion today has been so far a lot around the the inputs, it's around the basically poor nutrition. 
Um, but let's not lose the fact of the other bit, which is the physical activity. And there are some wonderful new technologies around encouraging kids to do physical activity. So I've got, you know, we bought a smart trampoline a year ago, um, and our kids actually go out there and they use it because there's this iPad that tells them they squish fruit on the, on the trampoline. It's, it's a game. So get, it's, turning activity into a game is something that's, that, that kids can teach us about and we can offer the opportunities for them to do. Of course, the balance then as a parent is how do you balance that against your desire to get them off the screens in the first place? And so it's, it's not easy. But I think the ability for, I, I think as, as adolescents, there's the ability to really focus on how can they be empowered to ask questions around the home? Mm. Because, and that's where I think the comment around schools is really important. If they're getting messages at school around what's a healthy lifestyle, what's the right amount of bad foods to, and good foods to eat, what's the right amount of alcohol to drink, then they can ask those questions at home. And um, the, then how do we empower the parents to say, yeah, maybe we should change the way we model. Mm. Um, there's a question here. Instead of feeling overwhelmed, it's important to select what is working and do more of this. What do we choose or how do we choose? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I actually think that's a fantastic point. And indeed, um, I, it's a point I've been trying to make recently around closing the gap. Um, sorry to sort of slightly divert to uh, another issue, but that's another issue that's overwhelming. It's about in, it's about high, trying to change an entire society, and that's not just the Aboriginal society, it's also how the rest of, of, of this community deals with Aboriginal people. And, and I believe one of the reasons we are not making progress is that it's just becoming too big and too hard. And how do we hone down on something that's, that's much more tangible that can lead to significant change that we can take credit for? So that's why I think, you know, there's no doubt that focusing on the tax on sugary drinks is, is an absolutely blindingly obvious thing to really focus on because, boy, that would be a big win and it would be a really important win. And you can say that's an important step, but you cannot let it be the be-all and end-all. It has to be part of this overall comprehensive strategy because we've heard from Maurice that silver bullets don't work. Mm. Um, and when you talk about a tax on sugary drinks, what size of a tax are you talking? Um, I'll have to ask the expert. 20%. There you go, 20%. As much as possible. Uh, okay, so um, I mean, that sounds like it should be quite a straightforward thing, but in fact, that's kind of turned out to be the nub of the whole barrier in the sense that you have to work against the industry, uh, food and drink industry lobby. Uh, have you come across these people directly? Um, we have, and we certainly come across them. I mean, what was interesting, and, and I've, I think I can see Carol Bauer up in the audience, maybe, um, that, that there's there's a, maybe not, um, but there's this idea of the folic acid um, discussion that we heard before um, that did come with some resistance from industry. That, that was able to be turned around because it probably wasn't as big a deal and certainly as big an industry as we're talking about with the sugary drinks. Um, we certainly get it with the alcohol industry and, and I think this afternoon's discussion is going to be really informing around that because, um, because there's, we worked very closely with the the women of Fitzroy Valley, who were the ones who were instrumental in bringing in regulations to take away alcohol, and boy, the, the, the difficulties they had, and that wasn't from just from the alcohol industry, it was from local traditional owners who had vested interests, uh, but they fought through, so you've got you to be tough. As we move into bigger questions, which is in Port Hedland, which is not just a purely Aboriginal community, how do you deal with that, that's, that's, that gets tough. Um, that's where I think it's really important to come back to two big things, one of which is what's the level of community support to do something, to reassure those who are trying to push this through that whilst they're champions, they also have the backing of the community. We've, we've got to keep doing that. And then the other thing we haven't done well enough is make that case for why this is a good investment. Um, everybody puts these things in terms of what's the cost going to be, either the cost to do it or the lost income from other things such as the, the revenues you get from selling this stuff and the, the taxation revenues, etc. Well, think about it the other way around. Think about all these investments in health as actually cost saving in the long run. And we need much better data, and there are people who can help us get this data, about the fact that if we, if we did a couple of these things on this list, the, the net benefit to the economy of Western Australia fairly quickly, but certainly in the last, in the next 20 to 30 years, is going to be huge. And, and that's the discussion that we don't have enough. Yeah. 
Or maybe we should take a leaf out of the women of Fitzroy's book and use them as our guide for resilience and, and determination. But I know we're going to be hearing from you at the end of the day again, but yeah. thank you so much for now. And I shall hand back to Griffin. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, guys. That was fantastic. And what an insightful and provocative morning we've had. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got lunch break for now. We'll be back at 1.45. Um, so get your sustenance back for the alcohol section in the afternoon, so to speak.